Okay. You? I think so. What what's your idea of having fun? My mine's going out on the lake. <laughs> Yours, yeah, and it's a little too chilly to go out on the lake this week. I was thinking uh, maybe our audience could help me with my next book. Oh, okay. So so uh, if if our audience has been following us and they know that I've written a couple of books, my first book was called Stories of Uncle Adrian, which is truly based on my uh uh Uncle Adrian Williams, who was the family's self-made millionaire and a grand storyteller. And then um, my second book was based on my mother. It's called Seven Lessons for Success. So right now I'm working on a book called Building Leaders. And it's my Uncle Don, Uncle Don's guide to constructing great organizations. So it's going to be a leadership book. It's going to be Excellent. a here's how you lead. But um my, both my uncles were Southern storytellers and my uncle Don was a master carpenter, a master builder. And I worked with him a lot uh, throughout high school and then into college and after college in the construction world. And um, my uncle Don would tell stories on the job site and he would, we would work along, you know, he'd be down there, we'd be up framing a house or something and he'd be down there cutting the lumber and he'd, he'd, uh, You'd hear his skill saw stop and he'd go, stop, stop, whatever you're doing. I got one for you. And he'd start telling stories. You know, he'd tell two or three stories um, until he ran out of stories. And then he'd go, all right, get back to work. And he'd go back to saw and we'd go back to hammer. Uh -huh. And so the book is based on his stories and the lessons that he taught in leadership. And today I just wanted to give our audience some of the stories Let's talk about the value of money. Okay. So here's one Uncle Don's story. He said uh, there was a couple that went to the county fair. And at the county fair, they had, um, uh, they had, I, I'm seeing Sean Carpenter popped up. He said he'd give you a 10 for your smile today. I love Sean Carpenter out of Ohio. <laughs> uh, he's just one of my favorite people. Uh, but so we had this couple that goes to the county fair and they had helicopter rides and the uh, wife wanted to do a helicopter ride. And the husband said, how much are they? So they walked over the helicopter rides and the guy said, it's 50 bucks to fly around the fairground. And the husband says, I'm not doing that. 50 bucks is 50 bucks and I'm not spending 50 bucks. So the next year they go back to the fair and the wife says, I want to fly in the helicopter. And it was $50 again. And the husband said, it's 50 bucks and 50 bucks is 50 bucks. And I'm not spending 50 bucks to fly around in a helicopter. And the third year and the helicopter guy is still there. And the fourth year, every year they go back and the wife never gets her helicopter ride. So one year the, the helicopter guy says, look, y'all come every year. Every year, your husband says it's too expensive. I'll make you a deal. I'll take you up for free. But if you say a word, it's going to cost you 50 bucks. What do you mean, say a word? I'm going to put you in the helicopter. I might do some loop-de-loops. I might turn it sideways. But if you scream or yell, it's going to cost you. We land and you hadn't hollered, it's a free ride. Wife says, I'm in. Husband goes, okay, I'm in. So they go up in the helicopter, loop-de-loop, -loop, upside down, sideways, not a peep out of the back seat. They land the helicopter, the pilot gets out. The husband is gone. He goes, where did your husband go? He goes, well, he fell out. She goes, why didn't you say something? The wife said, 50 bucks is 50 bucks. <laughs> <laughs> as you begin to see my uncle don was fun so that's what i got for you today i mean that's all i got for you is stories is that all right with you yeah well i give that one a 10 you i've been around you long enough that I, i've heard that one you've told me that one and so i'm just sitting here dying inside because <laughs> i'm waiting for the punchline well, I've got a presentation next week for a, a nationwide company and my friend who 
helps run that. Um, Sean Carpenter says he gave it an eight because I saw it coming. I, <laughs> Sean's probably heard me tell that one too. Probably on the golf course because Sean talked me into letting him play golf with me. The guy's a pro golfer and I'm like hitting it nine times to get it to the green. He hits it twice. It's on the green. Yeah. Uh, so what is but, the, the moral of the story there then? Well, the value of money. Okay. All right. <laughs> and, and I don't know that we're going to do a lot of morals today. We're just <laughs> going to do the story part because I've got to put this whole thing together. If you read one of my books, what I do is I have, uh, I, I teach in vignette. So I teach a lesson and I use a story as an introduction to that. And then I have an example. And um, so the stories teach. A, uh, so I would use that story when we're talking about uh, uh, talking about the value of money. Uh, now, I have a, you got ahead. a story? Yeah, no, I have a true story about a helicopter ride, though. Ooh. And that was, I went on my first helicopter ride with a friend and we were in the back seat. And it was one of those tiny ones, you know, those tourist ones where they take you up. We were in South Carolina. They take you up and they show you all this historical stuff. And so we're up in this helicopter. I've got this really expensive, nice purse with me. And all of a sudden my friend gets airsick, very, very airsick. To the point to where they're now asking the pilot, do you have a vomit bag? Do you have anything, right? Because it's going to come. And uh, didn't happen to have anything. I don't know why the pilot didn't have anything. And do you know what I had to do? I had to dump open that expensive purse. <laughs> throws up in my purse. When we landed, they told me they'd buy me a new purse. I never did see a new purse. <laughs> didn't want anything to do with that purse at that point. <laughs> Yeah, don't want to carry it. It would remind you of bad things. Oh, man. How does a pilot not have anything up in the air? But sure enough, my purse my purse was sacrificed. You were flying around the county fair. You might have been the woman with the 50 bucks. <laughs> oh, man. Well, here I got another one for you. Um, I'll be like Uncle Don. Y'all stop work for a few minutes. You need to laugh today. How about the value of quality people? Okay. You think about the value of quality people. Quality people are hard to find. And when you find quality people, well, you need to gather them together. So, um, so the city man's driving down the country road and his car breaks down and he walks to the farm. And there on the front porch of the farm is a pig with three legs. And for his fourth leg, he had a wooden leg. So he knocks on the door of the farmhouse and the farmer comes to the door because farmers always wait for the country uh, city boys to come knock on the door. Farmer comes to the door. He says, oh, my car is broken down. I was wondering if I could use your phone to uh, uh, call a repair truck. He said, certainly you can come on in. We'll fix you some iced tea. And uh, so he makes his call and he's waiting on the repair truck. And he said, I couldn't help but notice you have a three-legged pig on the front uh, porch. And the farmer said, oh, yeah. That is a high quality pig. That is a famous pig. He said, what do you mean a famous pig? He said, well, um, uh, years ago, our house caught on fire and that pig broke down the front door, came in and drug us all out of our beds and onto the front lawn so we would be safe. He said, once the uh, burglars decided to break into our house and the pig was on guard duty that night and he bit two of the burglars, chased them off and protected our family. He said, this is a great pig. And the city man said, well, but what happened to his leg? And the farmer said, well, with a great pig like that, you can't eat him all at once. Oh, my goodness. <laughs> <laughs> All right, let's see what your audience thinks of that one. Well, Should that I, I'm gonna I'm gonna rate that one maybe a five. five. Uh, yeah, my my heart want the pig to be eaten. That's pretty awesome. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, you can't eat a pig like that all at once. Yeah. My my uh -huh. five year old has just dis just discovered that when you eat chicken nuggets, you're actually eating chicken. Right. She's, she's finally starting to put together the two. Um, that animals actually are what's in the meat. <laughs> yeah. 
<laughs> yeah, they finally figured it out. Yeah. Uh, hey, somebody commented, they said, they give me a six for the story, but eight for hamming it up. <laughs> oh, um, man. <laughs> how about sales? Okay. We can do sales. You All want right. to do some sales? Sure. Um, well, sales skills are... We teach a lot of sales skills when we get serious. Today, we're not serious. But when we're serious, we teach sales skills. And, and I'm a firm believer that every person in the world is in the sales business. I mean, you're, you're either selling your spouse on, on dinner or you're convincing your kids to do their homework. You're, you're in the sales business. You're in the business of explaining information to others and helping other people um, succeed in life. Actually, the term sales is short for, or it's a derivative of the old English term salon, which means to help. Mm -hmm. So my uncle Don was in New Orleans on Bourbon Street. Um, have you ever been down to Bourbon Street? Yes. I used to live yeah. in Baton Rouge. Oh, really? Yes. Oh, wow. Well, I had never been until a few years ago. I always thought Bourbon Street was like like Rodeo Drive lined with Gucci shops and all this high-end stuff. I, I had no idea. My first trip down Bourbon Street, I'm like, oh my God, this is not what I expected. Yeah. Um, and for those of you who have been to Bourbon Street, I mean, it's, it's a street, it's packed. I think it's where the term bar comes from because there are places on Bourbon Street that there's just a, a bar across the doorway and they serve drinks out of it. It's a walking drunk fest. I mean, it's just, a, and it's not a place where you need to be drinking. I'm just telling you, you need to keep your wits about you. So my Uncle Don is down there. He's not drinking. His first trip to um, uh, Bourbon Street, New Orleans, he's walking down. And my Uncle Don is a, a huge tall man. He's 6'6", six, six, so he can see over the top of the crowd. And as you know, on Bourbon Street, you can see anything on Bourbon Street. Mm -hmm. and, and some things you don't want to see. Um, I remember that there was, um, they had a, I don't know how to phrase it, a burlesque show. They had ladies up on the stage and I stopped it. They were gorgeous. I'm like, wow. And they're all tall and they have Adam's apples. <laughs> oh, I kept moving. But uh, so my Uncle Don is walking down through Bourbon Street. He's looking over the crowd and he says, you're seeing everything. But over the top of the crowd, he said, in front of me, there's a, a, a silk top hat. You know, like a gentleman in a tuxedo with a silk top hat. He said, I can see that hat in front of me. And the crowd is parting around that hat. And we're all sort of shuffling together as we get closer. He said, uh, underneath the hat was a guy. And the guy is counting people. And he said, as I got closer to him, I heard him say 97, 98, 99. And when he said 100, he said, he's pointing right at me. And uh, Uncle Don said, I stopped. And the guy said, today is my birthday. And I have my shoe shine shop right here. And on my birthday, every year, I give away a free shoe shine to every 100th customer. And you, sir, get a free shoe shine. Uncle Don looked down. He said, "My, my, um, uh, my shoes. My, my uh, uh, shoes are just filthy." He said, I, "I'm um, just in a disastrous way." And he got the guy says, "It's a free shoe shine." There's a shoe shine box. Uncle Don says, "I'll take a free shoe shine." So he crawls up in the chair. Have you ever had a professional shoe shine? Not me. No. Oh. Uh, I think everybody should have a professional shoe shine. There is something magical about getting a shoe shine. Uncle Don said this guy was fabulous. He's working the towel, he, the smell of shoe polish on his shoes. And Uncle Don says, you know, I'm sitting up above the crowd in a big high chair getting a free shoe shine. And uh, so he looked over there and there's a big jar for tips. So he looks in his pocket. Uncle Don said, I pulled out my wallet and the littlest thing I've got is a $20 bill. No worries. The guy's working the towel and the smell. And he said, he's singing as he's working. Uncle Don, and it's tips. 
he's working the towel and the smell of shoe polish. And he said, he finishes and, and the shoes are just immaculate. He said, I got down out of the chair, peeled off a 20, threw it in the bucket. The guy said, thanks, have a great day. Uncle Don wished him a happy birthday. Went on down the street with gorgeous shoes. He said, about five feet away, there was one of those shops where they have all the T-shirts and things that you just got to see. And Uncle Don said he stopped, and behind him, he hears 97, 98, 99, 100. Welcome to my shoe shop. Every day on my birthday, I give away a free shoe shine. The hundredth person has come by. Uncle Don goes, only five people had walked by. The man's running a con. So he waited around until the guy finished. That customer left, gave a tip. And Uncle Don said, you got to explain to me how this works. And the man said, well, I want you to look around on Bourbon Street. Tell me how many shoe shine stands there are. And Uncle Don said over the crowd, he could see three up and down the street. And the man said, across the street, they're charging five, six, and seven dollars for a shoe shine. I give away free shoe shines every day of the year. My average take is ten dollars for a free shoe shine out of tips. The moral of that story is the way you present information is so more important than, than what you present. So anyone in sales has to learn something good. So if you hear something good today, you can just type in 97, 98, 99, 100. Yeah, that's a great story because there's a whole lot of truth in that one. But as a marketer, I would 100% agree. I mean, you actually, the way you position a product or a service, despite what bells and whistles it does or doesn't have, makes all the difference because we see it all the time, like low quality products or low quality services are bought up simply by the way it's been positioned. We've all, we've all bought something that's completely underwhelming once you get it, you know? <laughs> yeah. I have a friend who uh, is a professional speaker and one of the first times I spoke with him, he taught a piece about marketing and he asked the audience, he said, is the best like if it was a real estate audience or insurance or whatever the audience was, he said, is the best one among you, the one that gets the most business. And the room sort of stopped and said, huh? He said, is the person who is doing the most business, the very best person in your business. In other words, they're the best at what they do. And everybody thought for a minute and they said, no, he said, you're exactly right. Now, who's doing the most business? The person who's best at marketing. Mm -hmm. That's why they need to know a Jamie, mm -hmm. because you can help them with marketing. Because if nobody knows you're the best at you, what you do, if nobody knows that you're even in your business, right. how are they ever going to find you? Right. Right. I'll tell you who are the masters of this are toy companies. They are the masters at making something look way more than it actually is. Oh, yes. And they hook your kids and you're spending so much money on the silliest stuff. They are the oh. masters at that. Yeah. Uh, something that happened this year, we got a catalog. I think it was from Amazon. And now we've gotten a second one from somebody else toys for Christmas. See, when I was a kid, you got the Sears catalog. It came yeah. in about this time of year and there was a whole section on just toys where you go in there and if there was something you just had to have, you could tear that page out or circle it or put a post-it note in it or, you know, something. So your mother or father would see, yeah, maybe Zan needs this for Christmas. So I think I think Amazon tried that again this year. And now we've gotten a second one. Sounds like somebody's come up with, because our niece, um, the other day we took it to her. She's circling what she wants before the door day is out. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so let's see. You want some more stories out of my book? Okay. Oh, here's a good one. Here's a good one. How, let's talk about love. Okay. Let's, Let's talk about love. Let's talk about finding uh, uh, your, your, 
your soulmate, your dream mate, your spouse. Let, let's talk about that. Um, well, so we're going to have to after we just dumped someone out of the helicopter for 50 bucks, right? That's true. So, um, yeah. so here's, here's an Uncle Don's story. A um, uh, gentleman goes to, to, to college. And part of his mission in college is to get a good education, but also to find a wife. So he found a girl in college and brought her home to meet his parents and his mother didn't like her. So he goes back to college and he finds another girl and he thinks, yeah, this would be a suitable match. And he brought her home to meet his parents and his mother didn't like her. And over four years, he brought home an entire dormitory full of girls all over his college career. And his mother did not like any of them. So he said, I searched and searched and I finally found a girl just like my mother. She looked like my mother. She walked like my mother. She talked like my mother. And I brought her home to meet my parents, confident that I had found the right girl. And my daddy didn't like her. <laughs> That's uh, great. That's great. Uh, Let's see if we can, uh, uh, let's see if I can do a little better. Oh, here's a, here's a good one for you. God will save me. Um, we always are waiting for somebody to save us from our, our bad things. Uh, this is a story about God will save me. Um, there was an old man sitting on his porch and a flood was coming. And his neighbor pulled up in his pickup truck and he said, hey, let me give you a ride to the shelter. And the old man said, nah, God will save me. The water rose. He had to climb up on top of his house. And a friend came by in a boat and he said, come with us. We're here to save you. And the old man said, no, God will save me. And the water kept rising and a helicopter came. And they yelled, you know, they got on the, the bullhorn and they said, let us rescue you from your roof. And the old man said, no, God will save me. And the rain clouds parted and the sun shone and a large voice came down from above and said, look, I sent you a truck. I sent you a boat. I sent you a helicopter. What else do you want? God will save me. Wow. Or as my, as my mother used to say, the Lord helps those that help themselves. Yeah, yeah. You, you got to take an active part. I would so, say... That would probably fall into uh, maybe things not meeting your expectations, but they're the things yeah. that you need. Yeah, I like that. Meeting expectations. See, if you tell a story and it has no purpose, well, that's just it's not good. So we're, uh, we're having to have stories with a purpose. Um, I don't know if you're ready for this one, but I'll give it to you. The turkey and the cow were talking one day. I don't think I've heard that one. No, I can promise you you hadn't heard this one. Okay. Even Sean, Sean Carpenter hadn't heard this one. A turkey and a cow were talking one day. And the turkey said, you know turkeys, wild turkeys, they can fly. Those are big birds. They mm -hmm. can fly. But that's a big bird. And the turkey said to the cow, he said, I'd love to be able to fly up to the top of that tree, but I'm just too exhausted. I don't have any energy. And the cow said, well, why don't you nibble on some of my droppings? They're packed with nutrients. So the turkey pecked at a lump of dung and he found it actually gave him enough energy to fly up to the lowest branch of the tree. And the next day, the turkey ate some more and he reached the second branch. And the next day he ate some more and it got him to the very top of the tree where a farmer spotted him and promptly killed him and ate him. Oh, that's the end of the story. The moral <laughs> of the story, the moral of the story is bullshit will get you to the top, but it will not keep you there. Oh, that is so gross. I'm, I'm just telling you this. I got a bunch more. I'm, this is how authors work. That You have to sort through. I haven't seen anybody give me a rating on that story yet. So that's... <laughs> <laughs> uh, oh no uh, hey here's a good one you'll like this you have teenagers right yep 
So the teenager had just passed his driving test. How old is your oldest? 17. 17. Has he got his license? Yep. And he's driving? Yep. Oh, it's kind of frightening. Yeah. Oh. Yeah. It's amazing to watch the transition they go through when they start driver's ed and when they actually start driving and they begin to realize they're driving a 7,000 pound rocket ship and they can't control it all the time. Yeah. Yeah. So, oh, and do you ride with him with you know, hanging on to the dashboard? Not too bad. Thankfully, our vehicle is one of those that like it responds for you. So I'm not too, like it'll break for you if you get too close and stuff. So I'm not overly oh, worried. But <laughs> that's exactly what you need. Yeah, well, you like it'll stay in the lines for you. <laughs> oh yeah, keep me in, in between the, <laughs> in the safety. It's like training wheels on your bicycle. <laughs> yeah, uh, I can't see. Do we? Do we still have an audience, or did my last story run them off? <laughs> yeah, no, they're still here. They're still there. They're probably wondering what they got themselves into, though. <laughs> that's true. Hey, it's election day fun with Jamie and Zan. You got to have some fun as you go along. <laughs> Oh, here's one you can tell your mama. Here's one you can take home to your kids. A uh, teenage boy had just gotten his driver's license and he asked his father to drive the family car or to get his own car. And his father said, look, I'll make you a deal. You bring up your grades from C's to B's. You study your Bible and cut your hair. Then we'll talk about getting you a car. Boy thought about it, decided he'd settle for that offer, and they agreed on it. So six weeks went later, um, father said, son, you've brought up your grades. I'm very proud of you. Uh, you've been studying your Bible a little bit every day, but I'm disappointed you haven't cut your hair. The boy said, you know, Dad, I've been thinking. Reading in the Bible has taught me stuff. He said, in the Bible, Samson had long hair. John the Baptist had long hair. Moses had long hair. Jesus had long hair. And his father said, yeah, did you notice they all walked everywhere they went? <laughs> That's a good one. <laughs> you, that is one you can tell your, uh, that is one you can tell your boys. Yeah. How about newspaper articles? All right. Do you like newspaper? Well, I haven't read a newspaper in I don't know how many years. <laughs> well, newspaper just wrote an article about an 80-year-old lady. She just got married for the fourth time. The the uh, the interview the interviewer uh, asked her questions about her life, what it felt like to be marrying at the age of eighty, and then about her new husband's occupation. She said he's a funeral director. In the article, the newsman said, um, "Tell us about your other marriages." And she thought of a few minutes, needed a little time to reflect. Smile came to her face, and she said. Her first marriage was to a banker when she was 20 years old and then a circus ringmaster when she was 40. She married a preacher when she was 60 and now in her 80s had married a funeral director. And he said, how did you end up marrying four different people with such diverse careers? And she said, I married one for the money, two for the show, three to get ready, and four to go. Oh, brother. <laughs> oh, brother. <laughs> oh, man. I don't know if I'm getting better or worse here. <laughs> I should have popped some popcorn for this session. <laughs> you sure had. And, and let me see. How am I doing on time? Um, you, you probably got time for one more. I do? Oh, yeah. you got to give me two. How about okay, the old man more? from New Jersey that couldn't dig up his garden? All right. All right. So there's an old man in New Jersey. His son, uh, uh, he lives in New Jersey. He wanted to plant his tomato garden. But, you know, he was too old. It was very difficult work. And the ground was hard. His only son, Vincent, used to help him. But Vincent's in prison. And the old man wrote a letter to his son and said, Dear son, dear Vincent, I'm feeling pretty sad because this year I won't be able to plant the tomato garden like I've done for years and years. I'm getting too old and digging in the garden would be too difficult. Um, I know you'd help me if you were here, but, um, you know, unfortunately you're in prison. I hate it for you, buddy, but uh, uh, love you. 
Papa. A few days later, he got a letter from his son. It said, dear Pop, do not dig up the garden. That's where I buried all the bodies. Four o'clock in the morning, the FBI shows up. They dig everywhere on that piece of property. They dug up every square inch of it, trying to find the bodies, apologized to the man about uh, lunchtime that day and left. He gets another letter from son Vinny. He says, go ahead, pop, plant your tomatoes. That's the best I can do under the circumstances. Oh, brother. Oh, but I, I, I'm going to have to save some of these for my grandfather. He'll enjoy these. <laughs> oh, yeah. uh, I love it. Well, oh, let's see. Brother. You think I'm done or I've got more. I mean, <laughs> I got the cowboy who drinks, uh, who drinks. I got the Scottish golfing story. I got a funeral for a septic tank. Uh, well, I guess I'm giving you that one away, so I don't tell you that one. Uh, <laughs> Let's see. I don't want to do that one. I got time for one more. We, we should have called this the uh, blue collar comedy hour. Well, yeah. <laughs> I thought you were going to tell us story stories. You got story jokes. Is what we got. I got jokes. That's exactly right. I got jokes. I, um, I should have popped popcorn. Now I'm disappointed. Oh, yeah. Now, did you ever, <laughs> were you ever there when we actually did the Blue Collar Comedy Tour, when we did our speaking camp? Um, for those of you who are listening yeah. and you would like to be a professional speaker, uh, every summer we hold a, um, a professional speaker's camp, a uh, usually one or two day event. We hold it at uh, our country club here. Uh, and I bring in my speaking buddies from around the country and we, we have a big time. Jamie's been through it. Yeah. Um, and one of the things that we did that has been more fun than ever was we actually did the blue collar comedy tour. We put bar stools and we allowed the audience to ask questions. And it was one of the funniest things I think I've ever been in. You know, what was your mo most embarrassing moment as a speaker? Um, all that sort of stuff. It, it's uh, you know, speaking is fun. You if, guys, if you, you like guys have that. had some uh, some good good stories, that's for sure. <laughs> oh, yeah. So yeah. I got two more. Then you have one story where you actually gave a presentation in a barn or a horse oh, yeah. corral or something. Yeah, pe people think when you're a professional speaker, <laughs> you get to go to the Marriott, you know, in, in New Orleans, which I have spoken at. And, um, you know, it's all, no, I have spoken in, in a horse barn in yeah. Louisville, Kentucky. I have spoken in a warehouse. I have spoken on a train in Alaska. I have spoken uh, in bars. Uh, we, we were speaking somewhere in Wisconsin and they gave us a storage room. We had to clean it all out. The back of it was a bar. Well, I thought the bar was closed. <laughs> Two o'clock in the afternoon, I'm doing an all day course. Two o'clock in the afternoon, the barkeep comes in. He starts tinkling around. I said, dude, you got to be quiet. I'm teaching. He goes in 30 minutes. I'm going to have people here smoking cigars and drinking brown liquor. You better finish now. <laughs> oh, yeah. I, I've spoken in the Bahamas in um, uh, one of those big resorts. No air conditioning. It was 86 degrees in the room and you teach in shorts and flip flops. Um, you know, yeah, everybody thinks this is some glamorous thing. So yeah, yeah. if you can do it, I've done it. Every state in the nation, every major convention center, and those are the good days. And then you're teaching a barn or a yeah. warehouse or yeah. a barn, baseball stadium. I've done a baseball stadium. You did a cruise ship too, didn't you? No, oh, I've done several yeah. cruise ships. Uh, no. Can't complain and about you, a cruise ship. Well, the problem is when you're speaking, you feel like this. I mean, you, the boat's moving. So we learn not to do it up in the crow's nest. You go in the lowest place on the boat. Oh, okay. All right. Yeah, you can't <laughs> lean on a, yeah. So, uh, so I'll give you one more. All right. Actually, I have two, but I'm not sure I can tell the second one. It's a little bit, as my mother would say, it's a little bit racy. Oh, okay. <laughs> we'll save that one for later. <laughs> so a cowboy who moved out of, um, moved to Wyoming from Texas and he walks into a bar and he orders three beers and he sits in the back of the room and he sips out of one, sips out of another one, sips out of another one, sips out of one, sips out of another one, sips out of another one. When he finishes, he comes back to the bar, he orders three more. And the bartender goes, dude, 
if I just pour you one at a time, it, the beer would be fresher and it'd work out. And the cowboy says, you don't understand. I got two brothers and one's in Arizona. The other one's in Colorado. And when we left home in Texas, we promised we'd drink this way to remember the days when we drank together. So I'm drinking one beer for each of my brothers. Barcenter said, that's kind of cool. And as time goes by, he becomes a regular in the bar. He always orders three beers. He always drinks them like that. Everybody begins to understand, you know, they tell this story around the bar. One day he comes in and orders two beer. All the regulars go, woo. Finally, the um, bartender goes around. He says, uh, I don't want to intrude upon your grief, but I just wanted to offer my condolences for your loss. Obviously, one of your brothers has passed away and you can no longer drink for all three. <laughs> Cowboy said, no, that's not the case. My wife and I joined the Baptist church and I can't drink anymore. Ha, 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 ha. Oh, my 